1990 World Cup was more than just a festival of sport. Its theme song was an operatic aria, of all things, which didn't merely sell in its millions, but helped advance the fame of three football-crazy tenors. This music was written by the man who composed more famous arias than anyone else. One fine day, Visidate, O mio babino caro, Che gelida manina, E lucivan le stelle, all these came from the pen of opera's most performed composer, Giacomo Puccini. I think Puccini is a great composer. He's got everything that you'd want to hear in music. Uh, it's something very special. The, the, the music has a meaning, a message, and I think you can get audiences coming to listen to Puccini who've perhaps never heard any of his music before, who will be deeply moved first time round. He is a master dramatist. There's no doubt about that. A, 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 musical, a musical dramatist on a par with Mozart. It just goes straight to your heart, his music, and, and to your you know, sort of dreaming emotions, and not really to the mind, like a Mozart would, or a, you know, even a Strauss. That is human feelings, 100%. It's no, there's nothing that cannot be possible in Puccini. Puccini was born in 1858, near the lake which was to be his inspiration throughout his life, in the lee of the Tuscany hills and the town of Lucca, where his ancestors had lived for hundreds of years. He was the fifth generation of organists and composers who dominated the life of Lucca for something like 150 years. And at his father's funeral, which happened when he was five years old, the composer Pacini, who pronounced the funeral oration, said something like, uh, fortunately, we have here a son uh, who will become organist of the cathedral and carry on the tradition and bring great honour in his family. <laughs> Lucca was a staunchly religious town, but it ran thin on Christian charity. With his father dead, Puccini's family struggled. Young Giacomo lived in a modest apartment in Via di Poggio in the shadow of the church where his father had been organist. But brought up by his mother and four sisters, he was a spoilt and indisciplined child, often playing truant to go off with his friends. Nonetheless, he did start playing the organ at the San Paolino and San Martino churches, though it's claimed he stole some of the lead organ pipes to trade for cigarettes. But outside the church, there was more music to be heard in nearby Pisa than in Lucca, as actor and Puccini opera producer Simon Callow discovered. Lucca was by no means a backwater. It's a, it's a city of some, uh, some personal reclame and great history, and indeed lots of um, um, historical interest and lots of life going on there. 
There was an opera house in Lucca, the Teatro del Giglio, and uh, they had short seasons in the spring, so we could have seen opera without having to hike the hills to Pisa. But hike to Pisa he did, all 20 kilometers, when he was 17 years old. The reason? A new masterpiece by Italy's national composer Verdi was to be given its local premiere. The story goes that he had no money and no ticket, but that was no obstacle. He just bluffed his way in. Puccini came to Pisa especially to see Aida. As far as we know, it's the first major opera production that he saw. This was a very respected and excellent opera house and is splendid both physically and acoustically. So he also may have heard it better than he'd ever heard an opera before. And one can only imagine the excitement of uh, the recently composed opera uh, with all its exotic effects, with its extraordinary atmospheric touches. The 1870s and the 1880s were very much the era of grand Italian opera. And when I say grand opera, I mean opera in four or five acts, usually with a central ballet. Now, during the whole of that period, uh, Italy, I think, only produced two operas, uh, which were really, you might say, exportable. Uh, one was Verdi's Aida, which is a masterpiece. The other is Ponchielli's La Gioconda. Um, a critic said of the other grand operas that were produced at that time that they tended to drive out of the theatre in the second act everybody who hadn't fallen fast asleep in the first. A young musician who went to listen to Laida warned him that there was a new world that arrived, that it was not the old world of the melodrama in numbers, in pieces stacked, that he was used to listen to. And then, in Laida there is this taste of the grand opera and of the grand scenes that in the end have hit Puccini Puccini. I guess the whole experience was, a, was not exactly a road to Damascus for him, but it certainly might have clinched in him the idea that the operatic theatre was his destiny. To look for opera, the best place in the world was Milan, home of the proudest of opera houses and steeped in the great tradition of Italian operatic composers. Puccini came here to study music, but it was Milan itself that inspired him. I'm sure Puccini must have been absolutely thrilled by the scale and the excitement of the city, which was amazingly self-confident, having established itself as the capital of United Italy, was at its peak, really. And uh, so he, he kind of had access to things that he never, ever dreamt of in Lucca. When he wasn't out on the town or with his friends, Puccini was studying at the Milan Conservatory, if study is the right word. Most subjects bored him to tears, and in one lesson he wrote, Oh God, help, goodbye professor, I'm going to sleep, I'm dying. But composition was taught by opera composer Ponchielli, so there was one subject he could get his teeth into. And at this, at least, he worked successfully, if not enthusiastically. His passing out piece was a widely praised work for full orchestra. critics all said when that was performed as here is a man with a specifically symphonic talent and indeed when he actually uh, set to work in his very first opera which was admitted for a competition he didn't win the first prize he didn't even get an honorable mention it was called Levilli uh, but there uh, he said when the libretto was offered to him he wrote to his mother and said uh, I think this will do for me very well because it requires a certain amount of symphonic description, which is something which I think I excel in. In fact, music publisher Giulio Ricordi picked up Levilli, and at his first attempt, age 26, 
Puccini achieved a moderate success. Not surprisingly for a first effort, Puccini's music carried echoes of the great tradition of Italian opera. O Sommo Idio has the influence of the bel canto, the beautiful line, the beautiful singing of the earlier 19th century composers, but there's no question about that. From Bellini to Puccini, what makes a great composer or any great artist is that you know that this is his fingerprint, this is his sound, unique to him. I think Puccini was open to being a part of his musical world and listening to performances, but he was very true to his own romantic, in his own stylistic sound from, from the very beginning, actually. You know, you, you, we do the, the, the Le Villia aria and we do uh, Nessun Dorma, and there's that Yambababi or yes, and you, so that it always is flowing and always giving of the soul, giving of the heart. You can hear the Puccini that will come in, in Le Villi. It's a very, very intense opera, plenty of inspiration. And uh, it's already a mature opera, because if you think that between Le Villi and Manon Lescaut, there's just one another opera, and then you have the real masterpiece of Manon Lescaut. Puccini's breakthrough came when he was 34, after his second opera flopped. But it happened in the face of opposition from the man who'd become his mentor, Giulio Ricordi. He thought that the story of Manon was too overused ever to be successful. It was Puccini himself who chose the subject. And when his publisher, Ricordi, uh, said to him, well, what about Massenet's opera Manon, which, of course, had by that time become a, a world hit, Puccini replied, well, that doesn't matter. Uh, Massenet will have done it like a Frenchman with the powder and the minuets, and I shall write it like an Italian with desperate passion. <laughs> Manon Lescaut was an immediate success with the critics and public alike, partly because of the passionate emotion of the music. Its story features the woman, Manon, who let her young lover down by going to live with a rich older man, but then went back to her first love with disastrous results. Puccini follows the psychological twists and turns of their relationship, perhaps most of all when she wins him back again. It's wonderful to see in the Manola score where she's saying, you know, yes, I've been bad, yes, I've done this, yes, I did that, yes, I did this, but please. Hear me, do you know what I mean? And that, you know, but, ah, you know, is perfectly musically, emotionally, you know, spoken out with every instrument and every, every feeling. He seemed to have had a great sense of acting in his music.
find the Mental Disco duet to be highly emotional, highly dramatic, a wonderful combination of music drama in a real reality Italian emotional dramatic sense and a master in terms of dealing with the dramatic flow of the story and uh, bringing the orchestra, the melodic line and also the orchestral colors supporting that both atmosphere and that drama. The sense of the theater, the sense of a picture, the sense of just how long a thing ought to go on. He, uh, he had a very sharp sense and, and would add a, a five or six measures here or cut them out there or, or rearrange the effect. Uh, he was particularly impressed with how an act ought to end, the kind of stage picture that he wanted to leave in some, and um, he got that, some of that, I think, from Verdi. I think that for what regards the structure theatrale, the structure theatrale, the last Verdi was for him very important, the last Verdi. Ma c'è una suggestione di tipo più musicale che credo sia una suggestione che nasce da una sorta di, di traduzione in italiano delle emozioni che lui ha provato da giovanotto conoscendo Wagner. He's very much influenced by Wagner's harmonies, especially from Tristan and Isolde. At the beginning of Act Three of Manon Lesko, there's a most beautiful prelude, uh, which really quotes a lot of the love music from the previous uh, parts of the opera, particularly Act Two. And it's extremely um, influenced by Wagner's Tristan. Puccini's orchestration also shows signs of his awareness of other foreign composers. Per quel che riguarda la strumentazione, è certo che lui conosce i francesi molto bene ed è attratto dalle stesse cose che i francesi suggeriscono, io direi soprattutto da Bizet. Il secondo atto della Bohème non sarebbe pensabile se non si sapesse che Puccini alla scala dall'oggione della scala ha sentito la Carmen che lo sconvolse addirittura. It was a contemporary masterpiece which wasn't a grand opera. It wasn't period. It was about ordinary people, ordinary everyday people. But at the same time it had enormous elegance. Real people, real lives, real emotions. A revolutionary idea in opera and Puccini took it up enthusiastically. He was now well off but never forgot the hand-to-mouth years of his student life in Milan and used these memories as the real-life raw material for his next opera. La Boheme features a group of impoverished young friends, including the seamstress Mimi, whose love affair with the poet Rodolfo is tragically cut short by consumption. He, he put something, I dare say, of his youthful self into it uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, of course, created in, in Mimi uh, a character who is the prototype of so many of his heroines. Not that she's, not that she's uh, masochistic or, or, or depressed, but she is a woman against whom the uh, odds are stacked. And uh, he finds an empathy with her, a kind of compassion. Turbata, poi smarrire. 
Puccini creates this sense of pathos just by repeating the, not just the tunes, but the words and echoes. And these accumulate and create a very intense, poignant sense in this act. When he took her hand in the first act, Que Jaili da Manina, and when she quotes that in the last act, I mean, you always you feel it inside. He broke down when he wrote The Death of Mimi. And he said, I've just seen my child die. And yet, not long after that, he was out with his friends drinking and celebrating. Well, that's the two sides of the character. There was certainly a bohemian side to Puccini's character. A great number of his friends were artists of a rather bohemian sort, and they founded a bohemian club, which had all sorts of comic rules to it. So I think that one of the great strengths of La Boheme is that it did arise from the bohemian streak in Puccini's character. He also flouted convention in matters of the heart. He fell in love with one Elvira Gemignani, the wife of a merchant friend in Lucca, and they began a passionate and scandalous affair. She eloped with him in 1884, and they eventually moved to the nearby village of Torre del Lago. By then she had produced two children, one of them possibly Puccini's. They were able to tie the knot in 1907 once her husband died, and hence a dangerous liaison turned into a tempestuous marriage, fueled by Puccini's serial infidelities and Elvira's deep resentment. Aveva tante donne, ma lo corteggiavano anche, ma di garbavano le donne, sempre garbate. Faceva tante berichinate. Tante berichinate. Sì. Trovò perché lui andava a, gio a giocare a carte, no, quello lì era, era un qualche scappatella che lui faceva. E presso questo bimbetto dice, te suona pianoforte così la Elvira senta, sente che io sono al lavoro. Fai via, tin, tum, plum. Ma questo bimbetto, ne aveva, ne aveva dato soldi. Dice, o oh, che musica? Suona stasera mio marito, la sorella via, si insospettì. In camicia la notte, venne giù dalle scale. Questo bimbetto, quando la vide, e si spaventò, eh. prese dalla finestra, scappò, scappò e via. Perché? E qualche donna, e scappatelle, faceva le scappatelle, e a lei non diventava le bugie, ma lei poi se ne accorse. L'Elvira era gelosa. L'Elvira era gelosa. In certe scene faceva la fine del mondo. A strong and jealous woman must have played on Puccini's mind, for those were exactly the qualities of the main character in his next opera, Tosca. Puccini based it on a tragedy by the French playwright Sardou and wrote it as a violent story of jealous passion and hopeless love, common themes in Puccini's operas. Tosca is in love with the painter Cavaradossi, but also desired by the evil Scarpia, who tries to blackmail her into bed by threatening her lover's life. It's just a wonderful character to sink your teeth into because there's everything there. All the emotions, you know, of hate, love, you know, she's in a moment of tremendous despair asking God, what has she done to deserve this behavior? She's always, what has she done, you know, why?
Tosca premiered in Rome in 1900, and although the public loved it, several critics loathed it. When Mahler first heard Tosca, he said, nowadays any fool who can orchestrate can have a success with an opera. Uh, I mean, he obviously regarded uh, um, Tosca as, um, as the height of vulgarity, the same as later Professor Joseph Kerman said that Tosca was a shabby little shocker. German critics have a way of being quite dismissive of non-German music. And uh, <clears throat> some rather influential German critics uh, had thought they had disposed of Puccini. And it was really <clears throat> only about 30 years ago that uh, I think Puccini really became sort of academically respectable. Very, very few conductors dislike Puccini. Very few singers do. Uh, and um, even people who've just uh, uh, played the piano for Puccini, uh, Puccini operas for rehearsals, they come away absolutely convinced that here is a musician of no mean order. And after all, people like Schoenberg and Berg and Ravel, they admired Puccini right from the start. Puccini è famoso perché è riuscito a lasciare alcune tracce eh, memorizzabili. Però secondo me Puccini è grande perché pur usando queste tracce memorizzabili ha un'idea dell'opera direi omogenea, sinfonizzante. Pensi il Lucian Le Stelle nella Tosca, insomma, se non ci fosse il clarinetto di mezzo eh, questo Lucian Le Stelle avrebbe tutto un altro significato. Cioè dire c'è sempre un'attenzione del, suggerita dal timbro, dalle caratteristiche dello strumento che poi si riversa sulla voce del cantante. Non è mai il cantante che presta una voce allo strumento, è lo strumento che suggerisce al cantante una linea melodica. Puccini, non c'è dubbio, è un grande inventore di melodie, ma non bisogna dimenticarsi che le melodie di Puccini nascono prima in orchestra e poi vanno a finire in palcoscenico. E questo è un fatto, direi, modernissimo rispetto anche ai coetanei di Puccini. Another of Puccini's qualities, and one of the reasons his operas took years to compose, was an obsession with dramatic accuracy being true to the inner lives of his characters, but also simply getting his details right. Tosca is partly set in the Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome, so he went there. He was very careful, actually, to do what you might call field research and to come up to where we're standing and uh, listen to the effect of the dawn bells. And the result is a wonderful campanological symphony, you might say. Sardou had the very bright idea that Tosca should be able to leap straight from the battlements of the Castel Sant'Angelo, where we are now, uh, straight into the Tiber. Well, of course, that would be impossible because there's a main road between the Tiber and the Castello, though not as noisy then as it is today. And also, of course, Sardou wanted, I think, the vision of the Tiber in the back cloth, and that would have been pretty well impossible.
Tosca was the first opera partly written in a new villa Puccini had built, especially for him, in Torre del Lago, right on the shore of Lake Massachusetts. Today, his granddaughter keeps it as a museum, with some rooms just the way they were when he lived here. Do come in. Uh, this is the room where my grandfather spent a um, great part of his time. It was a living room and a studio workroom. When he first came to Torre del Lago, the house was uh, a tower. And um, when my father bought uh, the house, uh, around the house there was only water. Anyhow, you can see from that, that picture, you see how was the, the house when he lived here. Yeah. He could uh, get into, from the, the gate into the water, and in the little hut, it was for the boats. Puccini's real love was the lake, and in particular, the sport of duck shooting, which he pursued with more energy than his composing. As this unique footage of him shows, he made his friends among the hunters who lived in the villages around the lake, and they would go off together to womanize, to party, to drink, and to shoot. Ma lui veniva spesso a caccia qui per le caccine, era un passionista che tirava i caccini. E quando veniva sulla nostra palude, che era molto meglio della sua di là, torre del lago, e la, il problema era che, che si trovava la ganga dei pescatori e dei cacciatori, era Bardoria, ecco. Si trovavano tutti insieme, e fiaschi di vino, luci bruciati, e il pesce che facevano la mangiata lì, si incordavano tutti come violoni e stavano bene. E tanto con Puccini, se andava a caccia, c'aveva sempre da bisticciarci perché lui voleva sempre ragione. Ecco, lui voleva, cioè, aveva il diritto di precedenza e se lo sbagliava della mazza di dietro, era un canale, preferiva che tu gli tirassi, ecco, sbagliato lui, doveva sbagliare quel, anche l'altro che era dietro. Almeno lui te raccontava. Una volta a casa qualche uccello ve lo dava? No, perché lui era di molto, come si dice, tirchio, come si, avaro, ha capito? Non era tanto spegnoso. Ma il lago era una source di inspiration, as well as recreation. Poi quando andava anche a caccia o con la barca o si usciva sempre là per se la carta musica vicina. E io mentre viaggiavo con la barca si spostava una parte all'altra se ne veniva qualcosa e scriveva musica. The lake is often thought to have inspired some of the music of Puccini's next opera, Madama Butterfly. One night at the villa there, hearing the boatmen out, you know, kind of calling to one another. And it reminded me very much of what you hear in the uh, prelude that, uh, to the last scene of uh, Butterfly, which is sort of dawn over the water there. Uh, there's something so local about the sort of impression, and yet Puccini knew how to universalize it. Today, the local composer has given his name to the village, and every summer, a festival of operas is held in a specially built arena by the lakeside of what is now the resort of Torre del Lago Puccini. There seems to be a particular piquancy to hearing his music in the location that inspired it. Most resonant of all, perhaps, is Madama Butterfly. Though it's an exotic story of ill-fated love between a visiting American sailor and a local Japanese girl, it manages to be local, Japanese, and universal all at once. Seeing it here by the lakeside and uh, knowing that this is where, where Puccini was composing is a, a very special thing. It has something special because he was born here very close uh, to my town and so I feel him very, very much, much more than others. This is where he used to live and where he, you know, inspired, you know, and, 
I know he never he went he never went to Japan, so you know makes it more special because of that. The source of the opera's resonance with the lake may lie partly in the impressionist sensations that both evoke. A number of painters were drawn to the lake by its palette of impressionist colours at dawn and dusk, and Puccini looked in turn to the equivalent in music, the atmospheric impressionism of the composer Debussy. Le emozioni di un certo mondo vago, di, di nuage, insomma, la Debussy, esiste, però non è Debussy, perché esiste una pulsione di tipo drammaturgico che è diversa ovviamente da quella di Debussy. Debussy really was the inventor of the whole tone scale uh, and uh, in Peleus and Melisande for instance he uses a great deal and it's extremely similar certain passages to the uh, parts of Madame Butterfly. And Puccini uses it, as I say, for an exotic effect in Madame Butterfly. At home, Puccini made himself unpopular with Elvira by inviting a beautiful Japanese soprano to study the role with him for six months in the villa. It's evident that they were examining more than just the score together. La sopportò tanto tempo in casa la sola Elvira perché prendesse bene il lavoro che doveva fare e allora lei era gelosa ma di fronte agli interessi Stava zitta, ci leva un occhio e poi anche tutto il resto. E sicché il giorno noi bimbetti si stava a guardare eh, come camminava, come vestito col kimone, sì. Era sempre con Giacomo. If life was pleasant with the soprano, it was going downhill in other ways. Well, the main trouble was, of course, Elvira, who was really intensely suspicious the whole time, not, I would say, without reason, and their relationship became very stormy and tempestuous, and it culminated in a scandal in which she was actually threatened with imprisonment. She behaved really a bit like a madwoman. The so-called Doria scandal began after Puccini crashed his car in 1904 and broke his leg, the hospital discovered that he had diabetes, so he was laid up for a long period. A local girl called Doria Manfredi was hired to help look after him, but Elvira eventually imagined illicit goings-on between them and publicly denounced Doria. Just for once, Elvira was wrong. Siccome era qui, era donna servito da Puccini, e Elvira si diventò gelosa. E sicché mortifica la ora, mortifica la dopo, questa qui si avvelenò, ha capito? Otto giorni di agonia e la mia mamma andò a trovarla, Odoria, perché l'hai fatto? E lei disse, mi sono pentita, ma ormai non c'è niente da fare. E dopo morta l'hanno trovata che era ancora vergine. Elvira moved away to Milan. But although he was shocked and disgusted, Puccini stood by her, paying off the Manfredi family after they'd had her sentenced to prison. Meantime, he looked for a subject for his next opera and returned to the author of the play on which Madame Butterfly was based. Puccini went to see his new hit, which was, of course, in a language he didn't understand. But in David Belasco's case, this hardly mattered at all. Belasco was the supreme theatrical maestro of his day. His famous trick as a dramatist was scenes without words, which could go on sometimes for a quarter of an hour. But what he did above all was to experiment with theatrical texture, 
with situation and with atmosphere. So, of course, Puccini had found his man. That was exactly who he was looking for and what he was looking for. Puccini, who worked on the principle that opera plots should be visually self-explanatory, set to work with Belasco, the man who relied on visual effects rather than dialogue. The result was Puccini's La Fanciulla del West, another opera set in an exotic landscape of the imagination, never visited by Puccini, this time the wild west of the gold rush. I think Europe has always had this curious fascination with the United States as a place of renewal and unlimited space and the romance of the West and the desert and the wilderness. And um, you certainly get that in Fanciulla. It was a completely new type of exoticism. Uh, Puccini's imagination was so often stimulated visually and the vision of the vast Californian forests certainly goaded his imagination. La Fanciulla del West is another story of jealous love bringing down a hero, who is this time to be lynched by a mob led by his rival. He asks that his girl should never find out how he is to meet his end. When it opened at the Metropolitan Opera in New York in 1910, La Fanciulla del West broke box office records. Not only was it the hottest ticket in town, but Puccini was voted the most famous man in the world in a local poll. Hello. Hello. He came, he saw, he posed for photographs. But it was New York, in fact, that conquered him, for he was like a child in an enormous toy shop. He bought a motorboat and had it towed up Fifth Avenue, and then purchased one of the eight Lancia cars he was to own. He was dazzled by the speed, modernity and frenetic energy of the huge city. Thomas Edison, who was a great fan of Puccini's, gave him a gramophone. New technology fascinated him. Back at home, he bought an early radio set, a motorcycle, which his son had to drive, and more cars and boats. Yes, we can say that he was really a man of the 20th century because he liked uh, the new discoveries. He had a telephone as soon as they could have it in Torre del Lago. Uh, he had many boats, motorboats, cameras and the new guns. Uh, it was always up to date, I would say. But the 20th century also saw the invention of new and more destructive guns. When the First World War broke out, Puccini was forced for once to acknowledge the existence of social and political events. But as ever, what he saw was not a dispute between nations, but the human tragedies of dying soldiers. 
Puccini was immensely depressed by the whole thing, and his letters are full of this depression, saying, you know, what on earth is the point of this? It just means that thousands of people are going to be slaughtered, all absolutely to no purpose. Um, and this was very much in contrast to a feeling which was going through Europe to a great extent, uh, that war was going to be a great purifying force. And I think it's to Puccini's credit that he didn't think that. Though isolated from the effects of the war at home at Torre del Lago, his worsening health and depression were added to when even the lake ceased to be a sanctuary for him. He had to leave the lake. There was a, during the war, there was a, some kind of a peat factory or something, and, and uh, great smells and, and smoke, and he found it unendurable. He's, he was very sensitive to impressions. But uh, I think if you live in an environment that you really like it, it, and see it in all sorts of different atmospheres and times of day, uh, <clears throat> it becomes a sort of a part of you. His final and perhaps his finest evocation of water comes at the opening of his 1918 opera Il Tabaro, which is set on a river barge. In the opening of Tabaro, he's layered um, the orchestra, and it flows, and it goes f in beats of four, sometimes in three, has swells of woodwind and brass chord colors that are added, and there's constantly this flow. This, the river is going by. You hear in the basses, And on top of it is the flow of the river, the ongoing of the boat's life down the river. In 1921, Puccini moved his family to Viareggio, a smart coastal resort only five miles from Torre del Lago. He enjoyed its cinema and cafes and had a new villa built for him, but he found it hard to settle down to work on his next project, an opera about the fabled Chinese princess Turandot. He had seen the work of Schoenberg and Stravinsky, and echoes of their new harmonies and techniques were feeding into his composing style. <laughs> Lei pensi Turandot, popolo di Pechino, popolo di Pechino, pram, pram. Quelli sono accordi che scappano fuori pari pari dal, dal sacro di Stravinsky. Popolo di Pechino. È un tipo di armonia non analizzabile, non giustificabile con, con le regole tradizionali dell'armonia che nascono che nasce dalla conoscenza di, di, di quello Stravinsky addirittura. La grandezza di Puccini è questo, che si sente benissimo da dove lui prende queste sollecitazioni, che però diventano di Puccini. Puccini was also as thorough as ever in his research, as he waited impatiently for an adequate libretto. He listened to Chinese recordings on his present from Edison and called up people he knew for help and advice. He had a great friend who had lived in Peking and he had collected mechanical boxes. For some time, Puccini had been a great traveler and for some time he'd always wanted to go to the Far East. That he didn't do. But he did actually use melodies that were taken from these extraordinary music boxes. And one of them that becomes identified with the Princess Turandot 
It begins with ding, 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 ding. It's extraordinary how that has developed into this tremendous melody. But Puccini was never to complete his opera. In 1924, he was diagnosed as having cancer of the throat, probably caused by his constant smoking. He went to a Brussels clinic for surgery. The treatment consisted in the application of a collar of radium at his neck. It was a very heavy treatment. My grandfather suffered very much. He couldn't speak, so he, was, uh, he had to write uh, messages. And uh, it was um, very sad, I think. At that moment, he, he thought he was, go he was going to die. He was... So he, his last words were for his wife, for my grandmother. He, he wrote, uh, Elvira, povera donna, è finita. Giacomo Puccini died on November 29, 1924, in Brussels. He was 65. Elvira survived him by six years. The Belgians gave him a state funeral. His body was eventually returned to Torre del Lago, where it remains to this day in a private chapel in the Villa Puccini. With Puccini, a whole generation, a whole operatic tradition came to an end. The reason being that his contemporaries just didn't have his power of self-renewal. They couldn't build on a late romantic idiom and bring it into the modern age and at the same time keep contact with their audience. Many composers have been influenced by his general approach to opera, that is, his re reliance that the music must fit the drama, and that in some respects the drama comes before the music. In other words, what they now call music theatre might be said to have, been, uh, to have sprung from Puccini's operatic style. He was one of the people who started what we think of as modern music, certainly modern popular music. And it sounds, when one puts it that, that as if he was a, a prophet, but as so often happened with pioneers, is that they simply set the tone for what becomes the prevailing uh, feeling of the music of a given period. Over the last hundred years, I suspect that more people have seen Puccini operas than any other single composer. I think uh, you know Puccini is really there at the top, at the very pinnacle, the very, very best, the one who really knows how to appeal right to the heart. Mm -hmm.